Hello and welcome back. Steinhauer here. Uh, we left off talking about uh, how the Greeks uh, invented science and also astronomy by building models of how the planets moved around the solar system. And their models involved uh, retrograde mo explaining retrograde motion by epicycles. So small spheres on top of big spheres, uh, rotating to make, to make it so that the planets move actually physically do move backwards in the geocentric model. Um, I, I didn't mention in the last video, and I will now, just how complicated these got, right? Because a single, you can still make models and still make predictions, right? Your models have to make predictions that are observable. So the Greeks physically built these models mathematically. They said, okay, what if Mars's orbit is this big and its epicycle is this big and they're rotating in these particular ways, how physically will Mars then appear to move through the sky? And it didn't work. There wasn't much, it didn't take long before the predicted, I mean, it could do the general pattern, right? It could reproduce the epicycles, but it couldn't produce the, de the details of how that motion actually worked. If you go back to um, this picture, you can see how complex Mars's orbit is, right? It's not, doesn't, there's some, there's some asymmetries here that are difficult to build into a model with just a single sphere. This did not deter the Greeks. They simply said, maybe if two spheres isn't enough for, Ma for Mars, maybe we need three spheres, a sphere on a sphere on a sphere. And maybe if three isn't enough, four. I, by the time it got to Ptolemy, there, Mars itself had more than a dozen spheres on spheres on spheres. Imagine the mathematical, it, it, it speaks to the mathematical acuity of the Greeks that they were even able to calculate these, right? Not only figure out what the best sphere on sphere on sphere a dozen times is to give you the motion of Mars, but figure out what, given those spheres and how they're rotating, how that will actually make Mars move through the sky. It's a mathematical, a stunning mathematical achievement for, uh, for the time. Um, and yet, this made predictions, and those predictions still, after 20 years, after 30 years, the predictions of where Mars should be, given that combination of spheres, would disagree with where Mars actually was in the sky. And so um, that's the state of things. And that's where we were for over a thousand years, for 1500 years, basically, um, with, with the, the death of the ancient Greek empire uh, and the introduction of the Roman empire into that part of the world uh, the Romans were not nearly as interested in science and philosophy, um, and they didn't pay it much attention. And after the Roman Empire crashed, we entered basically a thousand years of, of the dark area uh, of the dark ages, right? Where where science isn't being done, where many of the advances that had been made were lost or forgotten or known only in books or to certain scholars, and no nothing new was being progressed. You have to fast forward fifteen hundred years before the next leap is taken. So that's uh, at least the Western story of how this works. Um, and uh, at this point, people start to question the geocentric model of the universe. Uh, and the first to do so publicly and with a new model of his own, of course, was Copernicus. You've probably heard of him. Um, he, uh, in 1543, actually the year of his death, he proposed a sun-centered model. And he said, hey, the Greeks had it pretty good, but you can make this model a lot simpler if you put the sun at the center instead of the earth. I'm not convinced and it's not clear that he actually believed that the sun was the center of the universe and not the earth, but he certainly was the first to actually make a model that had the sun at the center of the universe and then calculated how the planets seemed to move about it. But here's the big caveat to Copernicus. This was a huge leap forward and it did push forward the things that came after him, but his models were not significantly more accurate than Ptolemy's models. And the reason for that is because he kept the Greeks' insistence on perfect spheres. So he did have 
this Earth going around the sun in a perfect sphere and Mars going around in the sun in a perfect sphere. And he had the mathematical tools and the ability to figure out, okay, from Earth's perspective, then how will Mars appear to move through the sky? But he, it still didn't work. The model that he made was still inaccurate and he still needed epicycles, spheres on spheres, to be able to explain Mars's intricacies of Mars's orbit. And even then, after several years, they weren't all that accurate. Uh, Mars wasn't where he predicted it would be. So this is a big leap forward, but it isn't solving the problem yet. Um, to do that, we need to enter some other characters into the story. And one of the most colorful to enter uh, is this guy by the name of Tycho Brahe, um, who was a Danish astronomer and was the most brilliant observational astronomer of his era. And by the era, I mean the 1500s, the 16th century. He dies in 1601. Um, so he built himself with the uh, help of the uh, King of Denmark, who was a patron of his, um, the best observatory in the world on one of the Danish islands. And he made meticulous observations of the planets, of the stars. Um, and he... Uh, I have a, a note on parallax here. Let, let, me, let me just explain one of the reasons why the Greeks thought that the geocentric model must be true, thought that the Earth must be at the center and not moving. I mentioned already that they thought there would be trade winds and, and, and huge and birds and all sorts of crazy things that happening on the Earth. But the other reason they, they, they discounted it was because they knew that the Earth goes, if the Earth goes around the sun, they should see the stars moving over the course of a year. Nearby stars, even if it were, even if it weren't, even if it were a celestial sphere, the stars should look different on one side of the planet, on one side of the sun, as it does on the other side of the sun. This is an effect known as parallax. Um, we'll get into it more because we can use it to measure distances to things later on. Um, but he looked for this pair. So, so one of the reasons the Greeks, hey, those positions of those stars aren't changing over the course of the year, so it must be that the Earth is stationary. Tycho Brahe, again with better instrumentation that had ever existed in the world, tried to find this parallax and could not. And so he came up with a crazy geocentric model where the earth is the center and fixed. He liked Copernicus's idea though. So his model had the sun going around the earth, but all of the other planets going around the sun, which, which again makes it easier to explain all the retrograde motion things, but um, puts the earth still at the center of the, of the universe and not the sun. Um, he took meticulous observations on the locations of the planets and he had better instrumentation and better accuracy on those planets than anyone ever had. I want to show you, this is a, a, a drawing of his observatory. Now the lens and telescopes hadn't been invented at this time, or if they had been invented, they really weren't being used in astronomy really at all. So what did his observatory consist of? It was a giant building with one of these contraptions in it, which allowed him to very accurately locate and position the position of objects in the sky. And that was, this was the thing he used. I don't know if you can see this, um, but there are sort of people down here for scaling. This is, this is, a, this is a huge building dedicated solely to, de to determining the positions of things in the sky. And it was by far the best one that existed in the world at the time. So um, uh, he was a very eccentric character. Uh, there's lots of stories written about him. Um, apparently he got into a duel uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a young man and had his nose physically sli sliced off by a, by a sword. Uh, and so I guess he wore a silver prosthetic nose for most of his life. Um, he, his death story is also interesting. He, uh, the story goes, um, he was uh, attending a, a royal a banquet for the King of Denmark. And I guess in those days, it was a major faux pas to get up from your meal before the king did. Uh, and apparently he had to go pretty badly uh, and, and held it and held it and held it. And I guess died of a bladder infection some two days after that banquet, after he had to hold his urine in. So that's, I don't know, a fun story of how he died in 1601. The other amazing thing that he did was hire a young uh, upstart astronomer called Johann Kepler to work in his observatory. And Kepler was his assistant and helped with the observ observing. And upon Tycho Brahe's death, 
acquired the, the data, his data, specifically on Mars. Now, it's not clear if he absconded with this data in the middle of the night um, after Brahe died, uh, it's not, if he stole it from, from Brahe's true heirs, um, or if he was given permission to have it, it doesn't really matter. Kepler ended up with this data. Um, and again, it was the most accurate data that had ever been taken, um, and it was only available to him, and he did amazing things with this data. And he is the one who cracked the nut for what is actually happening on these models. So let's get to um, Johann Kepler, uh, who again lives 30 years past Brahe and has this data in hand. Um, and he was very mathematically inclined and he tried for years to find some sort of sphere epicycle system that would match the data. But the best he could do, the most accurate model he could be, there was still an, a discrepancy between where his model had Mars being and where the Mars actually was as observed by Kepler. Um, and, and the difference was eight arc minutes. Um, eight, an arc minute is a 60th of one degree. So this is a very small difference, right? A degree in itself is even a pretty small distance. It's, it's pretty big on the sky. The moon is about a half a degree. Eight arc minutes is much less than the diameter of the moon, but Kepler knew that Brahe's measurements were way better than that. And he knew that that eight minute discrepancy, you could not just shove that under the rug. That was real. Um, and so uh, that led him to try other shapes other than the sphere. And eventually he found one that worked, the ellipse. So there's a famous quote by Kepler. I'll read it to you. If I had believed that we could ignore these eight minutes of arc, I would have patched up my hypothesis accordingly. But since it was not permissible to ignore, those eight minutes pointed the road to a complete reformation in astronomy. And this is an important quote because it gets to how science works. Science progresses not when our models agree with the data. Science best progresses when they don't agree with the data. And that leads us to a better model. And that better model gives us some insight about how the universe actually works. And so um, this is a, an example of science working at the highest level, um, Johann Kepler. So uh, in the next video, we will uh, take a look at what Kepler discovered three laws of planetary motion using uh, using Tycho Brahe's data. Uh, we'll get into what those three motion those three laws are and what ellipses are and how all of this works in the next video. So, see you then.